You know, let's pick up on your last point <clears throat> about the, um, the upcoming summit uh, on Friday and Saturday with President Obama and President Xi. What will President Xi's takeaway be if human rights are not robustly discussed, if individual cases like, I mean, you mentioned Chen Quanzhen. Chen Quanzhen sat right where uh, Dr. Yang is sitting just a few weeks ago and made a passionate appeal for his nephew and other family members who are being retaliated against. His nephew is really a, a surrogate for him. He's now free, relatively speaking, and his family, um, immediate family, but his other members of the family are being tortured, including his nephew. And, it, and Leo Chabot, a fellow Nobel Peace Prize winner, just like President Barack Obama, uh, continues to languish in prison. Um, and you know his wife, pretty much under house arrest. Uh, it, it, it seems, as you said, it used to be standard practice that there would be political prisoners, religious prisoners, and others who would be released uh, when summitry would occur. Uh, it seems to me that, the, at the very least, our side, our president, needs to make a very strong and aggressive, diplomatic but aggressive appeal for these people who are suffering uh, such impunity. Anyone would like to uh, handle it? Dr. Young, and Young. Um, yeah, this hearing is uh, timely because um, we all know there is going to be a summit between President Obama and President Xi. I strongly believe that President Obama should set the tone of U.S.-China relations in this summit for his new administration and for the new leadership of China. It, this is a crucial moment to signal to the leadership of China that the quality of its relationship with the United States largely depends on how it treats its own citizens and on whether it lives by the universally accepted human rights norms for its international and domestic policies. Failure on President Obama's part to speak up uh, and address the human rights concerns uh, will send a wrong message to the leadership, the new leadership of China about U.S. priorities. And it may encourage the new leadership, the new chi Chinese leaders uh, to allow uh, the human rights abuses to continue. While we don't oppose the United States um, uh, vigorously uh, engaging with China, with Chinese government uh, on other issues, including uh, uh, economic relations, trade relations, uh, North Korea, and other security issues. Uh, we uh, believe uh, and hope President Obama will engage with the same vigor on human rights concerns. So I think it's a very good opportunity for him to raise, uh, raise a very um, uh, important cases of prisoners, as Mr. Chairman, you just mentioned. Qin Kegui, Liu Xiaobo, Wang Bingzhang, Gao Zhisheng, all these uh, uh, prisoners of conscience, we are not forgetting them. And President Obama should raise the cases in the meeting. Yes, Wei, Mr. Wei. I think in the past few decades, the human rights diplomacy of the United States has established a very reputable uh, image of the United States. Not only established the image, but also had a real effect, which ultimately led to the Communist Party's demise. Not only with good image, it also produced a very effective result, which ultimately resulted in the collapse of the communist clique. And the representatives here uh, maybe still remember, uh, since the pass of PNTR, the permanent uh, national trade relationship uh, with China, the human rights in China has uh, 
a situation has to be rapidly deteriorated. Deteriorated. I think either from the perspective to have a good new image of the United States or to establish this soft power for the United States, the United States should really uh, holding up this uh, ticket of human rights again. I agree with the Obama's that right during the, the meeting between President Obama and the President Xi, we really should do something regarding human rights. 但是我更希望 美国政府和议会制定新的国际战略，再把人权当作一个重要的呃内容，恢复几十年来的人权外交。However, I feel more important for the United States Congress and the administration to design a new strategic and to put the human rights on the frontier and for the future. Obama President Obama said that human rights and the universal value is a big advantage for the United States. If so, why don't you take this advantage up front instead of waste your time with the communist regime for other issues? So I hope I hope more that the United States will have a new strategy and new policy. Asian leaders have often said that the United States has no foreign policy. 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 What's the, what's the diplomacy of the United States? They don't have one, because if you do not take advantage of your universal value, then indeed you do not have advantage diplomatically. Let, let me say briefly, when Wei Jingsheng was let out of prison in order to get Olympics 2000, I was actually in Beijing and had dinner with him. He said something that I will never forget. He said, when American officials, any official, but especially American officials, especially the President of the United States, speaks precisely, transparently, uh, but boldly about human rights. They beat us less when we are in the Laogai or the gulags of China. When you are vacillating and weak and dismissive of the human rights agenda, they beat us more. It gets right down to that level, uh, to the prison guards and to the prison wardens. Uh, and I'm wondering, you know, to, for us to miss an opportunity to speak out boldly and aggressively on behalf of these dissidents who are being tortured and harassed in every and degraded in every way imaginable, um, for us not to take that, would you, the panelists agree uh, with Mr. Wei's assessment that we need to have a more muscular human rights policy? And secondly, uh, Mr. Dr. Yang, you made mention in your statement, uh, and I thought it was very, very interesting, that 60 peaceful uh, transitions to democracy have come as a surprise to the United States uh, because policymakers did not pay attention to the students, to the victims, to the activists, but we were focused like a laser beam, regrettably, uh, on the political elite uh, who have very little regard for the human rights of other people. Um, you also made a point, and I thought it was, it was very profound, uh, and I said it on my opening, that economic growth means everything that they have inculcated in China among the elite, uh, a corruption uh, that is indescribable, and that dis that, that's what keeps them afloat, as you put it, in your testimony, your written testimony, and I wonder if any of our panelists would like to speak to that. The conventional wisdom is that if we somehow trade more with China, they will matriculate from dictatorship to democracy. But as you have laid out, Dr. Young, precisely the opposite has been occurring, especially since most favored nation status, uh, now PNTR, was granted, uh, that we are actually keeping the dictatorship afloat because they have carved out the elite, 
They reward the elite and through corruption and through gross human rights abuse, especially through torture, they're able to keep the dictatorship intact. If you'd like to speak to that. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I think the Chinese government would learn a lot by taking a few pages out of the history of South Africa. When the South African apartheid regime fell, many black Africans were very, very angry at the way they'd been treated by the regime that had just been overturned. And so what the South African government decided to do was to have a Truth and Reconciliation Committee. One of the things that's clear when you study China and modern Chinese history is the Chinese Communist Party is terrified of the Chinese people. They think that they may be thrown out of power for not being sufficiently nationalistic. They and the Chinese people are terrified of the Communist Party and the power that they have. The only way out of this dilemma of absolutely polar opposition and fear is for some sort of reconciliation committee to come into place and to begin to examine the charges the Chinese people feel they have to lay at the base of the Communist Party and have the Communist Party be held accountable for those crimes which they have committed. Dr. Yang, or then Sophie. I actually just wanted to add a quick point uh, onto your question about what happens if there is no really audible uh, human rights related intervention from President Obama this coming weekend. I think it, it's actually two different problems. One is that it, it, would, it conveys such a lack of seriousness of purpose to, to fail to take that opportunity. I, I can't help but wonder, for an administration that has said repeatedly in public that it takes a whole of government approach to promoting human rights issues, I can't help but wonder, you know, what was on Jack Lew's agenda a couple of weeks ago? What was on Tom Donilon's agenda? What were the human rights issues they were taking up in this whole of government approach? It's, it's very hard to know that. And if you say that you're going to make vigorous human rights diplomacy a part of all of your interactions, and then it's awfully hard to know what those were, it's very easy for Xi Jinping to walk away and say, I didn't get challenged about anything. Why should I take any of this terribly seriously? And that has a related problem, which I think is ratifying a sense of incredible exceptionalism that the Chinese Communist Party holds up, that China is some, it may have signed on to international human rights covenants, but it's different. It gets to proceed on these matters its way. And to not be challenged on that, I think, only reinforces that sense. And so it's incredibly important to finally push back hard and clearly in a way that's audible, not just to the kinds of people who are sitting in this room, but to a much broader audience in China, which is looking for some kind of leadership and some kind of responsiveness to speak to the kinds of problems they're dealing with every day. I just put some addition. 就是过去很多的美国的官员，包括在座的议员们，跟中国政府打交的时候，都会感觉到中国政府是铁板一块，他们很顽固，他们意见比较一致。Uh, in the past, uh, lots of American officials, including represent congressional representatives, uh, when they were dealing with the Chinese Communist uh, government, uh, they would feel those officials uh, were very uh, hard, like a piece of iron board, uh, and they seem to have the same opinions. 在六四过去的二十年内，中国政府确实是这种状况，他们意见比较一致。但是在最近的四年，中国政府内部也已经有很多人站出来，开始讲人权和普世价值。啊、uh, ，in the in in the first twenty years after June Fourth massacre in 1989, indeed that was the source of that situation. But in the past four years also. Even within the communist government, a lot of people stand out and talking about the human rights and the universal values. We should tell the Obama administration that now is a chance. If we have a stronger voice about human rights, many people in the Chinese government will have a stronger voice about human rights. So we should let uh, President Obama know this is a good opportunity because if we, there is a voice for human rights, then we could hear even more the for human rights talks from the Chinese government. I think now the impact of the Chinese government will be greater. 
So if we talk about human rights now, emphasize that, then it will have a more impact to those officials within the communist leadership, which also would have a more impact to the people inside of China. I would like to add a few words. Please. And I do believe that this Friday when President Obama meet with President Xi, not only he need to emphasize the human rights importance for China, but it become a crucial a necessity for American security to do so. And I want to remind all of us, President Abraham Lincoln in his um, second inauguration speech um, about lack of justice um, to free the slaves had caused the severe casualty and loss in the, during the war. And he said, fondly we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty sculpture wall may speedily pass away. Yet, if God's will that it will continue until all the wealth piled out by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of the blood drawn with the, with the lashes shall be paid by another drawn with a sword, as was said 3,000 years ago. So still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And there's a rumor saying China today, they've finished their first submarines. They're in the process of doing five more. And America is a country that has the most submarines in the whole world, I suppose 16 of them. Is China going to arm race against America? And God had given us a blueprint and that is how we can achieve peace. I know today we use the word human rights, democracy, to replace the fundamental truth by God, but I think it's really important for us to go back to that. In Isaiah 32, 17, it said, God said that fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. So the path to peace is to act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with our Lord, our God. And the crucial timing for President Obama to uplift and honor the tradition, the faith America's founded founder upon, one nation under God, is because this is the first beginning of President Xi Jinping's legacy. And he's eager to learn. He's eager to build the rightful relationship with America. America must stand strong, not just for this country, but for the world. Thank you. Dr. Young, and then I'll go to Mr. Bellows. At this point, I want to address a myth, widely believed myth in the international community. Actually, I have been amazed by this well-trenched myth, um, you know, believed by world leaders, the policymakers, and the scholars. The myth goes as follows, that because China will punish those taking a strong stance on human rights with its growing economic power, affecting their all important trade relations with China, the human rights issue should take a back seat. That's a myth. But this myth is anything but tested. There's no past evidence to show it. We should ask, I list a lot of questions here. We should ask, what do, do you think the world leaders, China will do in response to uh, a strong human rights stance. Do you really believe that China will quit trading with a country whose goods it needs because the country demands better treatment of its citizens? How much will affect your economy, for example, United States economy? And are you willing or able to accept this outcome? How much will it affect China's economy? And what does it mean to this regime? We all know that the only source of legitimacy for this regime to continue is economic well-being. So I think that is the least thing that they would try to jeopardize. Uh, questions uh, are, will China be willing or able to accept the cost? So let us calculate how much we spend on Iraq war which toppled a dictator. If China really retaliates against this country with, with its economic power, how much are we willing to pay to help topple China's dictatorship? How much less the American taxpayers will pay for the spending of defense if China becomes a democracy? 
So I, we should consider these questions. I found this is, you know, some fear. It's self-imposed fear. We have to test it. This means to break it. I do have a past experience to show otherwise. I just give you a couple of examples. Number one, we, uh, we, uh, uh, Liu Xiaobo was awarded the 2010 Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, Chinese government uh, came out, uh, uh, vowed to sanction uh, Norway for this award. And just uh, four days after award ceremony, December 14th, the China-Norway strike oil deal despite tensions. That's the title of Wall Street Journal. And I read the first paragraph, okay. Beijing, China Oil Field Services Limited, a unit of one of China's largest oil companies, has signed a long-term oil drilling contract with Norway's State Oil, demonstrating that Beijing's theory over the award of a Nobel Peace Prize to jailed dissident Liu Xiaobo may not stop major commercial deals. And most of the recent example is Chen Guangcheng. Both the Congress and the um, executive branch took a very strong stance on his case last year, getting him successfully to the United States. What happened afterward? We still have a normal relationship, treating relationship. Nothing affects the relation of the two countries. And uh, for Oslo, I went back um, in May of 2011 to check. I talked to a, a, a staff member in the um, uh, um, uh, 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 you know, who was dealing with uh, a trade with China about the quota uh, of salmon importing, imported to China. He told me it is the officials, Chinese officials, who told them how to get around of the, uh, you know, the, the sanction. So they have to go through Hong Kong to avoid the sanction. So I think this is um, this means we have to test to break. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Meadows.